Hello, good evening and welcome everybody. Delighted to see so many of you here this evening for the fourth in our lecture series this year and the first of the Huntington's Centennial Lectures. My name is Steve Hindle, I'm Director of Research uh, here at the Huntington and I look after the Fellowship Programme, the Conference Programme and the Lecture Programme. 2019 represents the 100th anniversary of the signing of the indenture that turned Henry Huntington's private collection into a public research institute. And all our programming this year is designed to celebrate that extraordinary contribution to the humanities and, as Mr. Huntington himself put it, the uplift of humanity that was symbolized by that extraordinary gift. Our centennial lecture program is designed to use our existing endowments to bring back to the Huntington scholars who've worked on the treasures of our collections and to readdress those collections for an early 21st century audience, investigating not only their provenance and significance, but also their relevance for uh, modern society. So over the course of the next uh, eight or nine months, you will hear scholars working on the Ellesmere Chaucer or the Bad Quarter of Hamlet or Audubon's Birds of America come to this podium and readdress those treasures of the Huntington's collections from an early 21st century perspective. In each case, we take advantage of the endowed restricted funds that have been gifted to us over the years. And this particular centennial lecture is made possible by the endowment in honor of Ray Allen Billington, who was one of the leading scholars of the American West, uh, a formidable figure here at the Huntington and also at Occidental College. And the, the lecture was endowed for the specific purpose of addressing an aspect of the American West. Past lecturers have included Ben Madley last year, Carl Jacoby, uh, Neil Foley, and Ari Kelman. I'm delighted to say that this evening's speaker is TJ Stiles who, as I'm sure you all know, is a Pulitzer Prize-winning author and historian. TJ holds his BA in History from Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota, and his MA and MPhil in European History from Columbia University. In 2004 to 5, he was one of the first uh, Gilda Lehrman Fellows in American History at the Cullman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library. And in 2011, he was a Guggenheim Fellow in Biography. He's the author of three extraordinary contributions to historical biography. Jesse James, Last Rebel of the Civil War, published in 2002, which was winner of the Ambassador Book Award and the Peter Seaburg Award for Civil War Scholarship. The First Tycoon, The Epic Life of Cornelius Vanderbilt, which appeared in 2009, which received the Pulitzer Prize for Biography and the National Book Award for Nonfiction. And then most recently, Custer's Trials, A Life on the Frontier of a New America, published in 2015, which received the Pulitzer Prize for History, the Spur Award for Best Western Biography, and the William H. Seward Award for Excellence in Civil War Biography. And a small but very significant part of that volume was researched here in our Huntington collections. I cannot think of a more fitting scholar to kick off our centennial lecture series or indeed to give the Billington Lecture, to discuss how he was locked in his private room, a teenager's view of the last days of Elizabeth Bacon and George Armstrong Custer. Please welcome the Hunt Huntington's Centennial Billington Lecturer, T.J. Stiles. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the very kind introduction. It's a real honor to be back here at the Huntington. Um, and I especially want to thank all of you. It's very brave of you to come to a five-hour talk. Um, <laughs> the doors have been locked, um, so you're stuck. Um, the uh, title of my biography from which I'm drawing this talk and for which my research was done that I'll be focusing on, uh, as you've just heard, is Custer's Trials a life on the frontier of a new America. And that idea of frontier is something that we often hear. Um, Custer we think of as a figure on a <clears throat> geographical frontier. As, uh, to borrow a term from the historian Emmanuel Wallerstein, as the European world system, the way of organizing states and societies and economies and the world is that pressed into 
another world system, a native world system. And we think of Custer as being located on the contact and conflict point between these two world systems. But there's another frontier as well. That's the frontier in time. As so many aspects of modern American uh, political thinking, economy, um, society began to emerge during that period, Custer was a figure who lived out his life on that frontier in time. And actually, some of the most interesting things about him, the greatest troubles in his life, came from his difficulty in adapting to the very modernity he was helping to create. Now, this is what I try to do in my biographies. I try to take a well-known figure and present a new understanding of them. Uh, with Custer, there's been a lot of great work. I'm not reinventing the wheel, uh, but I'm presenting a new uh, camera angle on this familiar figure. And tonight's lecture, I'm going to focus on a collection that I use at the Huntington that does that with Custer, that provides an unusual camera angle that, that takes you, gives you a personal perspective on his life. And yet, through this perspective, there are things that we can see and things that are off stage that explain what it was that our witness could see. And our witness's name was Leonard Herbert Sweat, or Bertie, as he was known to his family. Bertie Sweat, in 1875, was a very familiar figure. He was a teenager who was suffering from anxiety. He had to drop out of uh, Phillips Exeter Academy, and he returned home to his parents who lived in Chicago. His father was uh, an old friend of Lincoln's from uh, their law practice days before the Civil War. He had worked for the administration during the Civil War, and being in Washington, he had made friends with a celebrity couple in Washington during the Civil War, George Armstrong Custer and his wife Libby. In 1873, Leonard Sweat, the father, uh, again, seeing how his son was going through these troubles, uh, he thought of the Custers. In 1873, he'd gone to the Dakota Territory for a law case, a murder case involving a public official. He'd renewed his acquaintance with Custer, who had just been redeployed there, and he asked him in 1875, could my son come and join you in the West at your new post, Fort Abraham Lincoln? Now, Fort Abraham Lincoln is located right about there. It's across the river from Bismarck in what is now North Dakota, what was then the Dakota Territory. And Custer said yes, sent him along. So what happened is in 1875, uh, Bertie agreed that he would go with the Custers to this remote place beyond the frontier as white Americans, as uh, citizens of the United States understood it. Why was this exciting for him? Well, for one thing, we have to remember who Custer was in 1875. He was a national celebrity for more than one reason. The core of his fame, the foundation, was the fact that he had been a very successful Civil War general. Now, most of the generals who were household names, whose faces appeared in patriotic paintings after the Union victory, etc., were those who commanded armies. Think about Grant, Sheridan, Sherman. Often, Custer would appear beside them. Custer was a division commander at the end of the Civil War, one of the very few division commanders to be a household name. And one of the reasons is that the nature of his Civil War combat, his Civil War image, cut against the grain of the Civil War in American, the American experience. The Civil War was our costliest war by far. The latest studies suggest that perhaps 750,000 Americans died in this war vastly more than any other war. Matter of fact, it may be more than all our wars combined. This was a war in which infantrymen lined up and blazed away with e at each other with rifles, in which they were blown up by long distance artillery, in which an individual's valor and skill did not matter. And yet Custer had a very different war experience and he represented something that was very different. He was a cavalry general promoted to Brigadier General at the age of 23, is in essentially his first battle, not literally his first battle, but almost, the Battle of Gettysburg, he played a key role in holding back the Confederate cavalry from getting behind the Union line on the third day. And he did this at the end of the day with a climactic charge. The cavalry fought in a slice of the Civil War 
in which they usually fought other cavalry, they often fought on horseback, they would close quickly with each other and fight hand to hand. Custer may be the last American general to kill someone in a sword fight in battle. In a war that destroy, was destroying America's sense of romanticism, its, its idealism that it went into the war with, a, a war that just began to create a, a more modern sense of the futility of combat for the average soldier. Custer was an anomaly. He was the classic dashing hero. And it played a role in his victories because of the nature of cavalry warfare. So he was a Civil War general, and he was also increasingly now, not increasingly, now he was seen as a figure on the frontier. In 1874, just before uh, Bertie had to pull out of school and agreed to go west, Custer had, had his, his uh, post-war memoirs, My Life in the Plains, was published as a book. Um, this was a publication of a serialized memoir. It had been published in a magazine. Uh, to give an idea of how Custer's self-congratulatory spirit uh, did not always go over well with the intelligentsia, the Independent reviewed the uh, memoir, and it said, General Custer is a brilliant and brave soldier, a fact of which we may remark he is perfectly aware. <laughs> but his egotism does not prevent him from writing sketches which are both interesting and useful. It was a story of his first year and a half or so on the Great Plains, starting in 1867, a year of a great deal of turmoil from him, for him, which he kind of glides over. He ended up being court-martialed and convicted, suspended from duty for a year and a half. He was very lucky that was all he got. But he came back and he fought in a campaign against the Southern Cheyennes, which had a climactic battle which made him stand out in the American public mind as the great Indian fighter, so to speak, the Battle of the Washita, which uh, many Native people today consider to be a massacre, uh, which sadly, as I put out in the book, was very much in keeping with the nature of um, the way the U.S. Army operated on the Great Plains after the Civil War. So this book uh, lifted him up to a new, it helped to create a new sense of, of celebrity, a sense of the man from the East who has gone West and mastered it. Um, as uh, the uncle of Theodore Roosevelt, Robert Roosevelt, who was a naturalist and democratic politician who lived in New York, after he read the, uh, My Life in the Plains, he wrote to Custer and said, I suppose you never come East, but if you do, you must not fail to call on me, as it seems I am never to get West and kill a buffalo under your auspices. Custer stood in as the, the uh, he filled in for the Easterner who was dreaming of adventures out in the West. And it was an image that he carefully cultivated. As you can see in this photo on the right, which he took when he was the celebrity guest or host for a celebrity guest, the Grand Duke of Russia, who in 1872 wanted to go out and hunt buffalo. And General Sheridan made sure that Custer came along in his custom-tailored buckskins. So this is the man that young Bertie was very excited to, to meet. And he met him in 1875. Here's a photo of Chicago from 1877, a burgeoning city on Lake Michigan recovering from the Great Fire. And the two of them boarded a train and began to head into what Bertie considered to be the wilderness. Now, this is important to remember because, again, as I mentioned, they're not heading into empty spaces, even though they're, not, they're lightly populated. This is rather a... Uh, a space in which the U.S. is beginning to force itself into. They're beginning to proceed from a built-up area, an area of built-up infrastructure, just to go back to this map. So you see in this map the, all of the dense railway networks of the east of the Mississippi, and you see how it just begins to fade off and break. And so this is an area in which not only are there fewer pieces of infrastructure, but it's more fragmentary. As they head west, they begin to travel into an area that is not so built up. So Bertie writes to his mother, May 30th, 1875, I want to tell you a little bit about St. Paul. So they've headed north into Minnesota now. It is one of the pleasantest cities I was ever in. It is situated on high bluffs on both sides of the Mississippi River. There are between 30,000 and 40,000 inhabitants, but it is very quiet. This morning, as General Custer was disengaged, we got a carriage and went up to Minnehaha Falls, which is now deep in Minneapolis, nine miles from here. 
85 feet high and 30 to 40 feet across. We left St. Paul by the railroad Monday night for Brainerd, where we take the Northern Pacific. We had a Pullman car and we slept very well. We took breakfast in Brainerd and then took a common car to Fargo, where since the train stopped, since they only run in daytime, we arrived at 2 p.m. and stayed till 10 the next morning. So again, there's no more overnight trains. The rail service is beginning to erode. Finally, they get to Bismarck. We stopped, we arrived at Bismarck at 9 p.m. the same evening and were met by Tom Custer, the uh, Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer's brother, and stopped at a hotel where the rooms were divided by very thin boards with paper pasted over them. The next morning, we all waked at about the same time and carried on a conversation with each other from different rooms. <laughs> the general, Custer was a Lieutenant Colonel in the regular army, but he had been a general in the US volunteers during the Civil War. I won't explain. They call him general even though he wasn't. The general said a pistol ball would go through the house from one end to the other. Bismarck is a small town of about 500 inhabitants. We left for Fort Lincoln at half past seven and got here at nine. This shows actually the site of Fort Lincoln on the uh, Missouri. In the general's house, here are Mrs. Custer, Colonel Custer, which was again the wartime rank of his brother Tom, and, Miss, and Mr. Boston Custer, who is also the general's brother. I like Mrs. Custer very much. She is quite young, she was 32, and rather pretty. We have not done much yet, as it is not safe to go more than two or three miles from the fort on account of the Indians, who are dangerous. So here you have a young boy, again, suffering anxiety, who's going out in this Western adventure, and he's going out, to, he's, as he sees it, um, to the frontier, to meet the Indians, to experience danger. He buys a revolver for $12.50. He's ready for anything. And yet there are things that are going on that he doesn't see. There are things that have been going on in Custer's life and in American history that are gradually coming to a head. And Custer is a man under pressure, even though young Bertie doesn't quite see it. For one thing, there is the whole question of why is it that it's dangerous? Who are the Indians who are they're so worried about? Well, when Custer arrived in 1873 in the Northern Plains, he set out on an expedition called the Yellowstone Expedition. And what it did was escort a survey party for the Northern Pacific Railroad. The transcontinental railroads were enacted. They were uh, first Union Pacific, which met up, of course, with the Central Pacific in California, was created by the Pacific Railroad Act. Then also later, they gave a federal charter to the Northern Pacific. The Northern Pacific survey parties were being escorted by this expedition on which Custer commanded the cavalry. They were setting out to uh, 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 survey a path through Lakota territory. Now the Lakotas, or the Western or Teton Sioux, as they were also called, seven tribes which constituted the Western Lakota Nation, or the Lakota Nation, the Western Sioux. Their territory consisted of the Great Sioux Reservation, created by the Fort Laramie Treaty in 1868, and also a very large area that was called Unceded Sioux Territory. The Fort Laramie Treaty, it's important to note, which settled the, what was called Red Clouds War, was essentially a federal ratification of Lakota conquests over the last century. It was an unusual treaty in which the United States essentially ratified the military conquests of the Lakotas, who had been at war with their neighbors. Again, we have to think about the native world as being its own world system. They had their own uh, set of conflicts, they had their own neighbors, in addition to the fact they were dealing with the United States. The Lakotas had been warring with the Pawnees, with the Mandans, with the Arikaras. Um, they had been warring with the Nez Perce, with other nations to the west. They had allied with other High Plains nations who had the, what we now consider the classic High Plains nomadism based on buffalo hunting. And the Lakotas had reached the height of their power in 1868, and the U.S. had ratified it. So the uh, Transcontinental Railroad committed the federal government to extinguishing Indian title to any place where the railroad thought it needed to run. So this was an invasion of recognized Lakota territory, and the Lakotas knew it. As they're marching into this territory in 1873, basically setting up the framework for a new conflict with the natives in the Northern Plains, 
Cusser himself was creating difficulties with his commander on that expedition, Colonel David Sloan Stanley. And this is a consistent pattern in Cusser's life, someone who had been elevated to field command in the midst of combat and was very good at it. He never learned management. This is a part of the new world that's coming into being, a world of corporations, of organization, of hierarchical society. Custer is in the flagship pioneering institution in an institutional world, and he's bad at it. He's great at fighting, but he's bad as a manager and as a subordinate. And he and Stanley have repeated fights on this March West through the hot uh, weather of the High Plains. Stanley has him arrested at one point. Custer tells a friend who's on the expedition that he's going to have Stanley arrested because he's been drinking too much. And then what happens? Sitting Bull launches two attacks. Custer handles his men very well with discretion. He's not reckless, despite what you may think from the way he ended up. Not that you know anything about that. But, and this saves his reputation. This was the pattern in Custer's life after the Civil War, creating trouble, saving himself for the battle, in this case, two battles. So that had created new tensions. Then in 1874, Custer was assigned to the Black Hills Expedition. The Black Hills Expedition was not sent to find gold. It was sent to scout a site for a fort because the army was understaffed and being cut every year by federal appropriations. General Sheridan, who commanded in the West, wanted to locate a fort in the southwestern corner of the Great Sioux Reservation so that he could retaliate against Sioux raids on settlers and emigrants west and on, on friendly native nations. It was a strategy to cope with a lack of resources as he fought other Indian wars in the West. Custer takes this expedition, goes into the Black Hills, which have two important aspects. One, they are, as you may have heard, they were a spiritual center of Lakota life. Also, some historians have argued even more important, they were an essential resource, a natural resource, because nomadism depended upon the survival of large horse herds and large buffalo herds during the winter. They needed timber, they needed shelter from the weather, they needed good grazing, uh, good grazing and good water sources. The Black Hills were a, a, an oasis in the High Plains Desert, and it was essential for the continuation of their economy and their uh, social organization. And by invading it, they violated um, the Lakota sense, not only of uh, their worldview, not only of their economy, but also it violated the sense of themselves as conquerors. The fact that they had conquered the Black Hills from the Crows and other nations, that this was their land by right, by right of conquest. So this set up another problem. Rain in the face, then in 1874, he was a noted um, Lakota war leader who had killed two men in the battles with, with Custer and his forces. 1874, Custer dispatched his brother to arrest Rain in the Face, and uh, they uh, managed to uh, trick him about their intentions. Uh, Tom Cusser tackled him in a uh, trader's fort in an Indian agency. He was locked up at Fort Abraham Lincoln, and uh, while the army tried to figure out what to do with him, after a couple of months he escaped when a horse thief had his friends come and break him out of the stockade, and Rain in the Face escaped too. Classic Old West stuff. But as Custer noted, the hunkpapas swear vengeance. Politically, Custer was under pressure. So he's got organizational difficulties that have created problems for him. He's got growing tensions with the Lakotas, this large and powerful nation. Then meanwhile, he had political difficulties that stretched back to the end of the Civil War. During the Civil War, and a whole period of the book I'm not really talking about now, one of the central relationships in Custer's life was that between himself and, and with his wife and Eliza Brown, a self-emancipated woman who Custer hired in the midst of the Civil War to be his cook. As someone who had grown up in slavery, she took advantage of this opportunity to really carve out authority and make herself into the household manager. She created her own patronage network, redistributing food to other escaped slaves called contrabands. She began to uh, try to educate the Custers, sometimes get frustrated with the Custers, out of their deep racism. Custer was somebody who'd actually resisted emancipation. It really brought Custer a long way. 
And yet at the same time, the end of the Civil War brought new tensions as Cusser began to turn away from the direction he'd been moving. He actually uh, supported Andrew Johnson in 1866 when Andrew Johnson campaigned on the swing around the circle against the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and also the 14th Amendment, which was up for ratification, which is the foundation of both civil rights and civil liberties in the US. Grant was disgusted. Uh, Grant assigned Custer to be the field commander, the lieutenant colonel of one of the new black regiments in the US Army. First time black troops were enlisted specifically for the regular army. Custer went over Grant's head, wrote to Andrew Johnson and said, I wanna serve with white troops only. After the swing around the circle, he got his reward. He was switched to the 7th Cavalry, a white unit. In 1871, Custer was deployed to Kentucky as a part of the federal offensive against the Ku Klux Klan. Custer had a small post where he had to assign his men to assist ass assistant U.S. Marshals in arresting Klansmen in a state where there were more troops deployed than in Mississippi in the Deep South. There was a rampant campaign by the Ku Klux Klan to suppress African Americans in, in Kentucky. Custer had this duty, he hated it. He wrote a sarcastic report in which he said, well, we've got so much ammunition, we have so many men in the post. Um, for exercise, the men can either do drill, fatigue duty, or they can go out and arrest Klansmen, of which I think the first two are highly preferable. He'd rather have his men digging latrines than hunting Klansmen. He was conservative politically. He didn't like the way in which the world was changing. He wrote sarcastically about African Americans in public office. This is a period when you had African American congressmen and senators and uh, members of state legislators. Custer was opposed to it. He had been strong for the Union victory, a key player in the Union victory, and yet he was opposed to Reconstruction. Needless to say, this created problems for him because the commanding general was now the, considered the radical Republican president of the United States, Ulysses S. Grant and Grant was not too happy with Custer's forays into politics. Finally, Custer was a man under pressure for financial reasons. He often went to New York. In the 10 years after the Civil War, he spent probably about two years in New York. And having pledged to his wife that he would give up card playing, he went to Wall Street, where in early 1875, just before he met Bertie Sweat, he went to a broker named Emil Just, who was a Hungarian uh, refugee who had fled the revolution of 1848, set up in New York as a stockbroker. And Just said, I trusted him, naturally. He didn't require that Custer put up a margin for his stock trades. Custer began to engage in short selling, a highly speculative maneuver for anyone other than a professional trader trying to cover his, his uh, bets. Um, Custer made, unfortunately for him, he made money on his first trades. He was a gambling addict. Those first trades did not set a pattern. He began to make more trades. He began to do more short selling. It was beginning to go south on him even before he went to Chicago in 1875 to pick up Bertie Sweat. So he picked up Bertie, they went to uh, um, Fort Abraham Lincoln where Bertie found that there was a, uh, um, quite a circle of officers around uh, Custer. And he wrote letters home about what they were doing. So again, here's another letter from Bertie to his family about what was going on at Fort Abraham Lincoln. Every morning we take a horseback ride from breakfast to noon. And in the PM, stay in the house and play billiards in the general's billiard room. And cards, read, go to cavalry drill at half past two, and loaf the rest of the time until supper. He complained that all the riding were out the seat of his pants and they got covered with mud, dust, and horsehair. In the westerns, they never show you all the horsehair that covered everything. Five o'clock dinner, and in the evenings, the house is crowded with company and they have dancing in the parlor. The general has got a beautiful house with five servants and they live in high style. I forgot to mention by this point, uh, Libby Custer had long since fired Eliza Brown frustrated with the fact that Eliza Brown outmaneuvered her for power in the household. Unfortunately, that's another story. The general does not know whether they will be able to go to the Black Hills or not. Listen, he writes to his father, the question is this, the Department of the Interior does not want him to go to the Black Hills. 
and the War Department does want him to go. Now, if you are willing, I would like to go with him, as there is nothing I can do here. By the way he talks, he does not expect us to go, I think. I suppose, of course, that General Custer is very ambitious and trying to get all the court favor possible. So if you have a chance to do him any kind of good turn, I wish you would. Meaning specifically to, to talk him up to General Sheridan, who is based in Chicago. I would be very much obliged to you, as he is very kind to us. Now, Custer had often used the term court in court favor, so I have no doubt that he talked to Bertie and urged him to write to his father to ask for favors. So continuing, Custer wrote a telegram to Leonard Sweat on June 10th saying, Herbert is not only improving daily, he wrote to Bertie's father. He writes home by, he's, he's not only well, but he's improving daily. He writes home by every mail. Yesterday, he and Boston, my brother, and a party of officers started out on a horseback for a hunt, expecting to be absent several days. He has spent several hours on horseback every day. This was not just a simple hunt. This was the sort of thing they did uh, in the West when they had no operations going on. Bertie wrote about this hunt he went on. He said, we had five Indian scouts and an interpreter who rode first. Colonel Weir, commander of the expedition, and his orderly and myself on horseback. Then a sergeant, five cavalrymen as guard. Then Boston Custer, and three gentlemen in a light wagon. Then a large wagon drawn by four mules containing all our tents and bedding. And then another wagon, equally large, containing our rations and oats for the horses. This, by the way, is an important point. The native ponies were descended from North African breeds that the Spanish had brought over. They could subsist on grazing alone. And it was one of their great advantages over the army, which actually had to drag along wagons full of oats and hay. We took out 2,200 rounds of ammunition in case of trouble from the Indians. There are two parties of Sioux Indians on the warpath in this territory, and we did not know but what we might meet some of them. They did not. Um, then he later wrote, there are about 25 scouts here, Indians, and I rode down to their quarters last evening to see about getting some moccasins made. This is an important point, too, one of those things that he did not see. As I mentioned, uh, they're, they're on the edge of the European world, which the U.S. is a part of, and the native world. And so there are a set of conflicts, some of which come down to the personal level, which uh, Bertie was not witness to. Custer's favorite scout was an Arikara scout named Bloody Knife. Bloody Knife himself was, that is, was from a mixed marriage, a hunkpapa and an Arikara. And he was raised with Sitting Bull's band, and yet he was constantly given a hard time because the Arikaras and the hunkpapas, who were a Lakota nation, were constantly at odds. And so Gaul, a fam who became a famous uh, Lakota warrior, was constantly teasing young um, Bloody Knife. And later in warfare, uh, scalped and killed Bloody Knife's brother. Um, so Bloody Knife eventually left the Hunkpapa camp and he sided with the army and worked as a scout. And this is important to note that they were not simply mercenaries working for the army, these native scouts. It was a rational choice based on their own national imperatives. Again, they still have their own nations, they have their own um, their reservations, but they're still uh, mixed into this surviving and ongoing native world in the Northern Plains. So to side with the army against their traditional enemies, the strongest uh, native nation on the High Plains, made sense. Uh, Bertie goes on. There are about 25, okay, 25 scouts here. Mrs. Custer gave a sheet and a pillowcase masquerade. Now again, uh, Libby Custer, in this fort with a handful of women and um, a group of officers, she is the social leader of this small group that are stuck in this remote post with little to do month after month after month. She has a role to play and she knows it. She's not simply there because her husband's there. She is the wife of the commanding officer of the, the fort. And so she has to constantly think up entertainment. She has, to, she has to keep the social network healthy and functioning in that small hothouse environment of the frontier fort. So she gave a sheet and pillowcase masquerade. There are only seven ladies in the garrison at present, so the party was very small. Everyone masked but Mrs. Custer and the general and myself. The general does not much care about company, and he keeps himself locked in his private room when there is much company here. Outsiders, I mean. Again, we see a man under pressure, which Bertie only glimpses. 
When he was a young officer, when he was a young commander in the Civil War, he was highly social. He was constantly mingling, first as a junior officer, wandering from camp to camp to see friends, then as a commander, sitting around the fire with his men. He had a camaraderie, a social engagement. But increasingly in these last years of his life, in the last year of his life, he's retreating from the men. He's beginning to hide himself in his room. What is his place in this post-war world? He doesn't know what's coming. He knows that since the Civil War, in which he fought battle after battle, winning him fame, since the Civil War, he's fought in three battles in the 10 years since the end of the Civil War. His opportunities for glory and fame are fleeting. Meanwhile, as I said, he's under growing financial pressure. He's under political pressure, discontent within the army at his uh, uh, self-promoting demeanor and his reputation within the army. He's beginning to retreat. It's a sign of a man under pressure. So Bertie writes to his mother that he would like to go home as soon as he finds out about the expedition to the Black Hills. He didn't want to sponge a living out of General Custer any longer. Mrs. Custer is going to give a party tonight and the first of next week, private theatricals, and then we all go camping for a few days. But then Bertie, at least, got a break. General Custer received a letter from the commanding officer at Standing Rock, a fort about 60 miles from here on the Missouri River, that there were several Indian chiefs who wanted to come and have a powwow. The treaty was very interesting. There were 30 Indians present, chiefs and headmen. It was held in a large room, the Sioux sitting on one side, the Rees, as the army called the Arikaras, the Grovan, and the Mandans on the other. The Rees, Grovan, and Mandans being small tribes, who had also been turned into vassals at various points by the Lakotas. They had joined together to fight the Sioux. There was an Indian interpreter on each side of the room, one who spoke Sioux and the other who spoke the Ri language. The general and several officers and ladies had seats at the head of the room. The general first made a speech to all the Indians saying he was glad to see them and hoped they would succeed in making a treaty that would be satisfactory to all concerned. The main points of the treaty were that they should live on friendly terms with each other and whoever broke the treaty first were to be punished by the whites. Again, the U.S. is a force in a matrix of forces. It's a big player, but at the time you had, as I said, 300 soldiers in this fort. I didn't say it was on the map, excuse me. Only 300 soldiers. They're, in essence, one tribe among many. They've obviously got a presence, they've built a fort, they have, they've built a town, they're building a railroad, and yet there's no sense that it's a story of one race against another. It is separate nations with their own strategic concerns, and the U.S. is a player, an ally to be brought in in these mutual conflicts. But you also see the attitudes that young Bertie has that reflects the attitudes of the army. He says, son of a star, the second chief of the Rees, rose, came and shook hands with General Custer, several officers and ladies, and as it happened, he shook hands with Miss Emma Wadsworth of the ladies and frightened her almost to death, she said. And then he made a short speech saying he was very glad to come and shake hands and make peace with the Sioux, and he hoped it would please the Great Father. He's about 35 or 40 years old, dressed very showily in a buckskin shirt embroidered with porcupine quills and beads and leggings and moccasins to match. He had his face painted a light coat of red ochre and a necklace of shells around his neck and large brass earrings. He's a very fine-looking Indian. He was immediately answered by Drag the Stone, the Sioux chief, whose speech was about the same effect as Son of a Star's. He was then answered by, more handshaking, White Shield, head chief of the Rees. But he is a sneaking, villainous-looking old savage of over 60, his eyes very small, deeply set, and black as coals, giving him a very treacherous look, peculiar to an Indian. So you see the attitude. We read this kind of thing from a lot of uh, the military uh, officers who went west riding home about the Indians as dirty and treacherous and savage. And yet there's also this element of respect, of even admiration. And Custer himself in his memoirs tries to work through the fact that he'd been outsmarted, outfought, outargued by native leaders and he had to respect them. At the same time, he had a hierarchical racial view, which at the time was taught at Harvard University and everywhere else, that there was a ranking of races. 
And Custer, like many Americans, comes to the conclusion, yes, they can be very admirable in nature. They are savages. But of course, the advent of civilization will cause them to die off. So coming to the end, we have the climax of Bertie's trip, which was a grand camping trip. And again, this shows the kind of stylized, formalized entertainment that the army brought out to the West. He said, we started on Thursday afternoon, arriving at camp just before sunset. So it was a several hour march to the Little Heart River. It was a beautiful spot. As we came over the hill, we saw the camp was situated at the foot of a line of bluffs, which make a curve in the form of a crescent, thus enclosing two sides of the camp, while on the other side was the Little Heart River. The tents were arranged in the form of a hollow square on three sides, while the wagons on the fourth side completed the square. The horses were fastened to the wagons, eating their suppers, and the men were sitting around their fires, cooking theirs. As we came into in sight, the band began playing, thus giving life and animation to the scene. I suppose you wonder how we happened to find everything in such perfect order when we came in. Well, the reason is this. Colonels Custer and Cook, Colonel meaning uh, Tom Custer, and Cook, with 50 men and 11 government wagons, went out early in the morning and had been working all day and had just finished a few moments before we arrived. This is something that Custer would do. He would turn his men, his unit, into a vehicle for his own personal entertainment. It was one of those things he did that a lot of higher-ups in the army got very frustrated with him for, this self-indulgent side of Custer. And they tolerated it because when it came to fighting, he was still very good at it. We also see the fact that they're bored. They're out in this frontier post with no war raging, with no particular duty, and they're killing time. And for a man who had risen so fast, this is a crisis. This is a question of where the rest of his life is going. Again, another element that adds pressure to him. Well, politics begins to intrude even in the West. Soon after Bertie leaves in September 1875, the Secretary of War arrives at Fort Abraham Lincoln. Custer, who's a fierce Democrat, sees the Secretary of War, who's a Republican, and he's heard stories about how under Belknap there are settlers, the official traders at Post, who have to pay bribes to higher ups, perhaps to Belknap himself. And so Custer can't wait to get Belknap out of town, but he begins to collect stories about corruption under Grant's War Department. Then he goes to New York. When he's in New York, he begins in September to indulge himself again, as he often had. Custer, uh, first he has to deal with money woes that have been piling up from a failed investment. In this new world of industry, a new world, remember, of the stock market, of a corporate economy that is beginning to emerge, Custer wants to cash in. He's engaging in those short sellings. He also is an investor in a silver mine, which he's been trying to float the stock of on Wall Street without success. And he's gotten news from uh, his partner in the silver mine that all the money they've borrowed against the mine have crippled it, and it's not going to make any money for them. He goes back to the office of Emil Just and begins trading in stock again, losing money, losing more money. He's also spoken to by a reporter from the New York Herald. The Herald says, well, what do you think, General, about this morning's news from the Black Hills negotiations? When Custer went to the Black Hills in 1874, it's famously known, he found gold. And 1874 was in the midst of a Great Depression. Gold at the time was money. The gold dollar still existed. So this is literally like finding an ATM machine in the uh, wilderness that's spitting out $100 bills. People go in violation of the treaty. Men of the 7th Cavalry are actually capturing miners and turning them back, but there are too many. They can't stop them. And in fact, some of them start a town uh, with a mayor by the name of Albert Swearingen. I don't know if you know that name. Um, by the town of Custer is one of the towns that gets started. So the federal government decides they will try to buy them from the Lakotas. The Lakotas are not interested in selling for all the reasons I mentioned. And Custer tells the reporter that the Lakotas are holding out because the uh, council was held right in the heart of Indian country, where the chiefs had the squaw men to advise them, meaning white men who had married native women. 
So again, very condescending view that the Lakotas can't hold tough unless they're white men backing them up. But it shows that there is a crisis that is brewing, one that Custer has played a role in. Libby comes to join him. Later, she'd gone to uh, Michigan to see family. She joins him at the holiday time. She feels the pressure as well. Whether she knows anything about his stock trading or not, I think she probably didn't. She writes to Tom back in Dakota Territory, the holidays have been rainy, gloomy. I did not have half the fun I had anticipated looking in all the shop windows. On Christmas morning, I went to church and came back weary and disgruntled. So they're in New York, abandoning his duties in the West, trying to entertain themselves, trying to make money. Custer is beginning to talk to reporters. He's beginning to talk to newspaper editors about giving them information about the corruption in the West to undermine Grant. They go to the plays. One of his friends is Lawrence Barrett, one of the great actors of the day. They have dinner at Delmonico's, and yet they're a couple under pressure. And in January of 1876, they get another visitor, young Bertie Sweat, who comes to see them from school. He says in a letter home, pardon me, Goes to his hotel, and then he walked down to the Hotel Brunswick, corner of 26th Street and 5th Avenue, where and inquired for General Custer. The clerk said he was not staying there, but received his mail there and took his meals in the hotel restaurant. I went back to my hotel, took a 6th Avenue horse car from the Hotel Brunswick, and arriving there, I found General Custer in his hotel office. He told me he was boarding across the street at 222 5th Avenue, and had told the clerk at the hotel to keep it private as he is writing a new book on the war and did not want to be disturbed by constant visitors. What he didn't mention was that he was also trying to evade service on papers because he was being sued for not delivering his war members, memoirs to another publisher. We then went over to see Mrs. Custer, who was as lovely as ever. I stayed about an hour and then started home for dinner, making an appointment to go out with Mrs. Custer at half past four. I went over and found her reading, we first went down to 39 Union Square to see an exhibition of trained fleas, which was very good. <laughs> then, as the general was to have, me have my head examined by the man who had examined his, we went down to see Dr. Wells on Broadway. Mrs. Custer played the part of mother for me very well. Once, every, once in a while, so this is a phrenologist, every once in a while she would... Uh, she would ask him a question and he would talk to her about me and tell her about what I ought to do and how I ought to live. Every time he would make an assertion about a point of character, he would ask her if she did not think it was so and if she did not find my character be this way or that. And then they went back to the Custers, found the general, and had dinner. General Custer gave me a very nice picture of himself. <laughs> we heard, also heard Mrs. Custer invite me to visit them again at Fort Lincoln next summer and I promise to go. They also wish to be remembered to you. Later, he wrote his mother. He discussed his phrenological chart. He called his phrenologist less of a phrenologist and more of a flatterer. And he said, you write to me, mother. You are afraid, I'm afraid I should lose my boy to Mrs. Custer. As for Mrs. Custer, she has my highest respect and admiration as a truly lovely woman. This is a very interesting passage. This is the last passage we have from Bertie himself. And it shows something of their relationship. The Custers were a troubled but passionate couple. They truly loved each other. They had an intense sex life. You'll probably thank me for not going any further on that. But also Custer constantly cheated on his wife, at the very least flirted with her, with other women. And she flirted with other men. And they also never had children. I'm sure it wasn't for lack of trying. Most likely it was because Custer, who had gotten gonorrhea at West Point, was either sterile from that or from the treatment with mercury that most uh, gonorrhea sufferers got at the time. So she was childless and she felt it. Bertie gave her a sense of what it was like to be a parent. Playing mother meant to him meant the world to her. She wanted him to come out, to give her a chance to be a mother again for one last time, as it would turn out to be. Um, as for Bertie, he was a teenage boy. Mrs. Custer was only 32. She was pretty good looking. And what was going on there, we can only imagine. He was, this was the 19th century. He wasn't writing too explicitly as a teenager to his mother. 
And yet there may well have been a sort of tension there. Either way, he very much liked this controversial couple. But controversial they were. That year, Custer began to plunge, 1876, very rapidly. He made more trades with just. He traded uh, a total of $398,983 in uh, total value of exchange of the trades he made, losing 8,578. At the time, the best paid railroad executives, the largest companies in America, earned $8,000 a year. Some earned 6,000. That's a gigantic debt. He had to beg to be paid for the book edition of his memoirs and got just $131. He contacted the uh, Red Path Lyceum Bureau, the leading lecture agent, who promised them that uh, they could do something for him, but it would not happen until after the spring. And so, finding no money coming his way, three days later, he signed a promissory note to Just for $8,500, due in six months with 7% interest. Custer went back to Chicago on his way to the Indian Territory. There he ran into Lawrence, um, or Len, excuse me, Leonard Sweat, the father, uh, who said that Custer explained to him that there was an Indian war brewing and that the Black Hills are going to lead to war. And so he had to return home to his men. And yet something else pulled Custer away. Again, as I mentioned, by now, places like Deadwood have been settled. Um, the miners are not leaving. Grant's administration has decided that they're not going to force the miners out and that the problem they decide are the native leaders who refuse to uh, accept life on the agencies and who are remaining living a nomadic lifestyle, either following or inspired by Sitting Bull. So they give them a deadline to report into the Indian agencies. And of course, they ignore those deadlines. So war is brewing. Meanwhile, Custer, while he's supposed to be preparing his regiment for battle, has been making contact with the Democratic leaders who, because of the Great Depression, now control the House of Representatives. And in 1876, they call him to testify in a corruption inquiry into Belknap, the Secretary of War, who it turns out has indeed been taking kickbacks from sutlers in order to get um, contracts to supply uh, goods to the troops in Western forts. Well, the real question that the, in, the Democrats are concerned about is this question that had driven Custer, the question of reconstruction. And so this Pennsylvania congressman who uh, brings Custer up to testify against Belknap, this is his campaign poster when he ran for governor of Pennsylvania. Racism is the one defining and unifying factor in the Democratic Party at the time. To overthrow reconstruction, they are trying to find, uh, and if necessary, they would uh, manufacture, but in this case, they've actually found corruption in order to dirty up the administration, in order to bring Grant down. And so, Custer is called to testify. He not only testifies, he wanders around Capitol Hill, arm in arm, with uh, General uh, Representative Heaster Clymer. Uh, they are seen together in the House um, restaurant. Custer begins to sit at the uh, Democratic uh, committee tables to write letters home on Democratic Party stationery. A serving officer, a senior officer in the US Army is openly allying himself with the political opposition to the commander in chief. His testimony is largely hearsay. There is indeed corruption in the War Department, without question. But Custer is going beyond simply fulfilling his legal duty. He is making himself into a political figure once again. And Grant is fed up. Grant, as Custer is ordered to uh, report west to help prepare the 7th Cavalry to go out on this campaign to try to drive in the Lakotas and uh, um, defeat them and force them to give up the Black Hills, uh, Custer's column is preparing to leave. And Custer is in Washington. He begins to realize he's gone too far. He begins to realize that, he, that uh, Grant is getting fed up with him and he's in danger. And he's, he can feel it. He is at the peak of his power and then he feels how rapidly he's descending. Once again, he's created a disaster for himself. And how is he going to get out of it? By going to fight another battle. But Grant pulls him off command of his unit. And so Custer has to beg. He leaves Washington without seeing Grant. That infuriates Grant. He's in Chicago. 
he sees Sheridan. Sheridan is fed up with him as well. And finally, he writes a letter pleading for forgiveness. He gets his department commander, Alfred Terry, to write a letter begging to let uh, Custer go on the expedition. And Grant, against his better judgment, allows Custer to march out of Fort Abraham Lincoln with the 7th Cavalry to fight against the Lakotas. Grant very narrowly missed saving Custer's life because Custer very narrowly missed facing the consequences of his political overreach. But it is the one thing that everyone believes that Custer can do, and that is to fight. And so when Custer goes out to Fort Abraham Lincoln, he, uh, just as he's about to leave, there is a telegram that is sent out by um, General Sheridan to Terry, who's accompanying the 7th Cavalry. And he writes a letter in which he says, I'm sorry that Lieutenant Colonel Custer did not manifest as much interest by staying at his post to organize and get ready his regiment uh, and the expedition as he does now to accompany it. But then he writes to Terry and says, you must rely on the ability of your own column, that is the 7th Cavalry, for your best success. I believe it to be fully equal to all the Sioux which can be brought against it and only hope they will hold fast to meet it. You know the impossibility of any large number of Indians keeping together as a hostile body for even one week. In the end, <clears throat> given this attitude in the army, the real mystery of Custer's life is not that he died at the Little Bighorn, that he made miscalculations, that he did not have enough men, that he did not understand what was going on the native side, that the Lakotas were at the height of their power, that they were emboldened and made more militant by the uh, U.S. government's actions, that they felt themselves confident and capable and had excellent tactical leadership. The Little Bighorn, to me, is not a particular mystery. The mystery is how Custer got this far. He was a man who was at odds with his times. He wanted to take part in this world that he was helping to create, a world of emancipation, a world, at least briefly, of civil rights, a world of a corporate economy, a world of an industrial economy, a world of organization and corporations, a, a literary world with a new literary sensibility and mass culture. Custer tried on all these fronts to take part in it, and yet again and again he created disasters for himself. The one thing that kept saving him from himself was the fact that he was a good battlefield commander. And in the end, he walked into a situation where none of his abilities could save him. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have time for questions. Uh, our experience in this room is that if you shout your question out, you can be heard, but we'll make sure that we repeat it from the podium if there is any doubt. Are there questions? Hi there, in the middle here. Oh, that's, that's an interesting question. Uh, first of all, I can't speak to the, the collection. I'm not working at the Huntington. Uh, I can't speak to their uh, collection history. But they were part of the Sweat family papers. And so, you know, these are not just his papers. The, the kids' papers are, to me, the most fascinating ones. I mean, it's a real personal look, you know, where he, he you know, writes about little details and he notices things and he thinks Mrs. Custer's pretty. And... Um, but uh, they're within a larger collection of the Sweat family. And so Leonard Sweat is one of those interesting, you know, kind of, uh, you know, D-list celebrities in history who is kind of present and does a lot of really interesting things. He's friends with Lincoln. He's, he's a witness and a participant in a lot of kind of operations of the government in the Civil War. So why they ended up in the Huntington, we would have to ask an archivist. But the, it's a part of a larger collection from a figure who is well worth saving, it wasn't just the, the kid who was, who was the focus. Yes, sir? Um, okay, uh, what happened with, yeah, thank you very much, I should repeat. Uh, what happened with um, Her, uh, Leonard Herbert Sweat um, and what happened with Libby? Um, I, I wrote down somewhere what happened with him. <laughs> Let me see. Um, 
Uh, he went on, he recovered, and he had a successful life. I believe he ended up in Colorado um, operating a business. I think he tried his hand at law for a while. He had a not very dramatic but kind of interesting life, but in the West. Uh, it's very interesting, his kind of lifelong fascination with the West. He ends up in Colorado living out his life. Libby, what's very interesting about Libby is she really struggled. And uh, she ended up having to, you know, she found out about this gigantic debt that Custer had left her. Uh, she had to settle it um, with, the, uh, with Emil Just, who no longer trusted Custer. And, um, and so she was left penniless. She had a very small pension. So she actually went to work as a secretary. And then she published, she got enough money from a settlement of a, a disputed part of her father's estate, which wasn't large, where she left her job for a while to write her first memoir. And that gave her some financial stability. She sent that memoir to Eliza Brown, who by now, having fired her out in Kansas on the plains, after years of, of both being friends, having adventures together, fighting over domestic power, fighting over questions of race, fascinating relationship. Eliza Brown had moved to Chicago where she married a black attorney and, and public speaker a category of person that did not exist in Ohio before the Civil War. And so she was actually a person of some substance and prominence. And, and so she got back in touch with Libby, met her in New York, and they reminisced, and, and Libby pumped her for her mem memories. And so the second of Libby's memoir, three memoirs, draws heavily upon Eliza Brown's memories, and by far is the best of the three. And it also shows their sublimated struggle for power inside the household, um, where Libby sometimes uses the book to get you know, retroactive revenge by mocking and belittling Eliza Brown, and sometimes shockingly racist terms. And then she'll turn around in another passage, write about how brave she was and what she did. It's a really fascinating story about this friendship and rivalry across the color line in post-Civil War America out in the Great Plains, very, very interesting story. So they ended up reconciling and becoming friends. She got some money from public speaking in her books. She invested it in real estate. The men in her life had blown their money. She managed hers very well. She lived until the 1930s. Wow. Yes, sir. So if, if the general was a compulsive uh, investor, day trader, he has these debts. Even if he's not investing in the Black Hills secretly, did you find any evidence that he might have had financial conflicts? Is he under pressure from New York stockbrokers and other corporations for intelligence, for tips? For oh, this is an interesting question. It sounds like he's done some reading. Or have you written a book, maybe? <laughs> um, uh, he's asking if, if uh, Custer himself had invested in the Black Hills, whether he was under pressure for tips or information. And the answer is, uh, no, I don't have evidence that Custer himself invested in the Black Hills. But he was contacted by, and some people have speculated that he, he was caught up with um, the man who had been acting quartermaster general of the army, who was one of Grant's old friends, um, was writing letters to Custer about a mutual friend of theirs, Ben Holliday, who, who co-signed the note to Emil Just, that personal, that promissory note. And, um, and Ben Holliday had been a big investor in railroads and stagecoach lines and steamboat lines in the Northwest. And so he wanted control of the settlers and the new forts to go in the Black Hills. They, they want, he wanted to control the stagecoach lines in, and they were hoping that Custer could give them an in on how to do all of this. Well, I mean, you know, Custer was not, he was kind of on the outs in the War Department. He was not a guy with inside information, um, but he was approached by them certainly, and he had connections to them. But his estate at the time of his death showed he, he certainly made no money and he had no extra debts other than the ones I mentioned. But yeah, there were people who were sounding him out. I mean, this really was the Wild West. Um, there, was no, there were n no rules on Wall Street at this time requiring transparency, insider trading. Uh, I know from my last book, previous book, Daniel Drew was notorious for insider trading. So when there was a credit bureau report on him for other businessmen, it said, yes, he's a, he's a uh, manager of the Erie Railway. He only trades in Erie stock, and since he knows Erie Railway, he's good for his debts. Like, that was the, <laughs> that was the attitude at the time. Insider trading made him a good credit risk, so. 
So, you know, Custer was approached by corrupt people, but um, I think if there, he'd had a way to, he might have actually taken part, but he didn't, to my knowledge. Any other questions? Hi, then. What is it do you think about Custer's personality that has lived so long through the ages and has pretty much brought everybody here to this auditorium in 2019? Well, you know... Yeah, what's, what's interesting about a, a uh, ginger-haired, flamboyant figure who's known for his statements about race, and um, yeah, there's, <laughs> uh, there's other figures who seem to resemble him. Um, you know, he's, he, he's, a, he's, he's really fascinating because he's somebody who possessed great ability and great capacity for self-destructive behavior. And, and he reflects, he was the exaggerated American. I mentioned the prologue. He's America, only on steroids, uh, you know, uh, multiplied by 10 with Thanos zapping him with something. I mean, you know, he's over the top in every direction. So <clears throat> the Civil War showed that he was, he was a great battlefield commander. And people hated his guts, admitted that he was good at fighting. And it wasn't just luck, it wasn't just flamboyance. He knew when to deploy his men on foot and use their repeating rifles. And he knew when to be cautious and he knew when to be aggressive. He, he, the one place he was totally at home and at ease was the battlefield. And yet he was a nobody from nowhere. And instead of reacting to it like Grant did, who was also a nobody from Ohio, um, Grant hated flummery, he hated ostentation, he hated people who talked themselves up. Custer reacted the other way. He was constantly talking himself up. He was constantly trying to craft an image. And I think it reflects a certain insecurity. That's my view, that he, was, he never was comfortable in his own skin. And, and he was always trying to impress other people because I think he was probably trying to reassure himself about himself. But, um, but you know, so he had this, this constant tendency to get himself in hot water and he, had a, he was a compulsive, he was a, I'm sure he was a gambling addict. Um, and yet, you know, he had ability and people loved him and he could get super sincere and his emotions were always on the surface. So writing the book, it's like when he's really doing something capably, I have to keep out the seeds about how he's going to mess up. And when he's totally messing up, I have to say, you know, people really loved him. You know, he was one of those contradictory characters who's just endlessly fascinating. I say he's like, if you've watched Breaking Bad, he's like Walter White. You know, Walter White could be doing these horrible things and you're kind of like, I kind of hope he gets out of this, you know? Um, I mean, just, he's an absolutely fascinating character. And he was in the middle of everything. He shows up everywhere. And when he's at his worst, there are people around him who are redeeming. Libby, like I said, she could be racist, she could be offensive, and yet she was just, you know, inherently a likable person who's, who's she's, doesn't have a lot of room in the world for herself. She's trying to find her way. Eliza Brown, I find an utterly admirable person She's not, to use the term from, from literature, she's not a magical Negro. She's not out there to save the Custers. She'll argue with them and present, tell them when they're wrong, but she's got to survive in a world that is completely structured against her. And she takes every advantage she can to carve out a little more for herself. And I think she's fascinating. And, and there are people all around Custer, who, even when he's at his worst, just are really absolutely fascinating. He was a real human being. You know, my first subject was Jesse James, who was really fleeting. It was hard to get anything personal about him. Then I wrote about Cornelius Vanderbilt, who I found out a lot about his business career, but any morsel about his family relations, you know, I, I was like gold because he was just a brusque businessman most of the time. With Custer, he was just out there all the time. His emotions are on the surface all the time. You can really get a sense of him as a person. So I think America, as it's gone through its own sense of itself, as you know, we question ourselves, you know, we've, we've, we've had myths that shaped generations, then those myths come into question. As the exaggerated American, Custer has, first he's been kind of like the heroic, heroic emblem, and then now he's the effigy who's set on fire for America's sins. And he had plenty of sins of his own, but he's burning for everybody, you know, how we feel about what America did wrong too. And, and they, you know, both are true. You know, he kind of deserves it, but also, we're putting a lot on him that should be spread around elsewhere, too. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. We, let's last question. Custer seems to have a 
Yeah, the question was, and this is a good way to finish, because, you know, the media, the image of him lingers. The question was, is he ahead of his time in fostering an image of himself? Was he imitating others? And, you know, it's a little of column A, a little of column B. You know, he lived in the age of mass photography, was new. And, you know, like, everybody was giving photographs. I mean, yeah, it's funny that Custer always was handing out photographs of himself. But actually, people exchange photographs all the time. It was like, it's cool. We have photographs of each other. You know, I mean, our parents didn't have that. Um, they, uh, you know, that this kind of the image and how you look matters. Also, in the Civil War, we have to remember he was from southern Ohio. He's from a border state culture. His father was from Maryland. And he had this affected style. And there were a lot of generals who had that style. They were all southern. You know, that, that you know, well, he's got golden curls and a flamboyant uniform. On the other side is General Pickett or Jeb Stewart. So, you know, it was in the culture, but it kind of situates him within this, the spectrum of American culture. He goes west, and he's, he is very much mimicking Wild Bill Hickok, one of his scouts, and Buffalo Bill Cody, another one of his scouts. And he, he loves to adopt the local style. He is, he's an actor. He's acting in a drama he's writing as he goes about his own life. And again, it's a part of creating an image for his own consumption as well as for the world's. And it's that effort of Custer trying too hard that is what really alienates a lot of people. And there's a divide. It's a self-promoting, self self-important Custer. I hate his guts. He's always trying to promote himself. It's that Custer is li he's energetic and alive and fun. And, you know, people just like being around him. And there was kind of two camps. And it was kind of how they felt about that. Um, and how we feel about it actually still shapes the way we feel about it. That image of the West, the performative West. And Custer, you know, his personality as well as his geographical location threw himself into that. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Please join us outside for coffee and cookies. But most of all, thank you for your support of our programs. Uh, please join me in thanking T.J. Styles for a portrait of an exaggerated American. Can I put a glass of wine in there? Oh, no, no alcohol for me right now. I'm sorry. But I'll take something else.